Thank you. So, first item on our agenda is approval of the agenda. Motion, Mr. Bracken, second, second. Mr. Kincaid. All in favor? So, Ms. Brown? Ms. Brown? So we, we have one board member that, that's Zooming in with this, this meeting. So is Leah available? Can she hear us? Okay. Yes, I can. Sorry, couldn't unmute. Approval of the agenda. Hopefully she'll run. Leah, are you in? I am. Okay, so she votes yes for the agenda? Yes. Thank you. So first thing on our agenda is board recognition, an exciting part of, of our um, honor here on the Board of Education. And I'd like to start off with Mr. Kincaid. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, it's truly my honor and privilege to read this resolution in recognizing music in our schools month. So uh, I'll get started with that. Whereas the month of March has been designated as National Music in Our Schools Month. Whereas our music educators dedicate themselves to bringing music into the lives of students every day. They are committed to ensuring that our district provides students with a well-rounded education, a critical tool for social and emotional well-being, an opportunity to work to their full potential, life skills needed to make decisions and juggle multiple tasks, months of practice and rehearsals, and the process of learning that takes place in the music classroom, whether virtual or distance in person. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Spencerport Central School District thanks the music and band educators for dedicating themselves to reaching all students with wonderful music experiences, and be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Spencerport Central School District hereby acknowledges with deepest appreciation the passion and commitment our music educators exhibit on a regular basis to provide a quality music education for the Spencerport School com community. Adopted this day, March 8, 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this point, I would like to invite our, our Burnaby community up and Mr. Kayaza, please join us along with the wonderful, wonderful people that you brought along with you. Can I have all my Burnaby friends come on up with you, Can we just make us a little bit of a maybe like right there? Look right on off, everyone. Oh, if I'm Hi everybody. So we're gonna, we're gonna do one of these things where we don't know which direction to look, right? Sometimes we're gonna look at this way at the Board of Education who is here tonight and sometimes we'll look out there and say hi to everyone. Um, but ultimately, and actually, if you wouldn't mind, let's just join me in. Hey, we're oh, coming down. Making, oh, you're gonna come down. We're yeah, coming we're down. Come down. <laughs>
So first of all, uh, as the principal of Burnaby, I personally just wanted to thank the Board of Education and the district for taking just a moment to throw a literal spotlight on some of the work that our Burnaby Learning community has done with regards to culturally responsive and sustaining education. What we've learned over the course of the past few years in working with this amazing group of students and with their families and many, many others who couldn't be here tonight was how important it is to ensure that as we engage in this work, we're providing a, a platform and an opportunity for our students and their families to have a voice in this work because it's so important that as a community we grow together and that their voices are represented. So I will tell you that this presentation might be an earlier version, so you might get um, a little bit less than we had done in our final version, and that's okay because we'll give everyone an opportunity to say something uh, tonight that we wouldn't have ordinarily. Are you guys are running to talk in front of this whole big group of people? No, probably not, but that's okay. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start, um, and I think I know how to click on that video, and Bobby, if you give me one minute, if you could click on it. Essentially, what this video is going to show you is, over the course of the past few years, we started working more and more with our students and families on that whole voice piece. We really wanted to make sure that as we were engaging and exploring CRSC, that it became more than just that a celebration of Martin Luther King Day. It became more than just that celebration of Black History. And although the work that we're doing, um, the work that you'll see has been specific over the course of the last month of Black History Month, it's really become much more encompassing. We're gonna talk a little bit about the work that we're doing right now with um, Women's History Month. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about how we celebrated and supported his, uh, Hispanic heritage. So this video will give a, a quick snapshot of some of the work that we've done. It was at the beginning of school year, probably in the summertime, where um, the internet, everything went all black, right? Everybody posted like this all black, right? And so, my daughter who goes to Eastridge, she was under the count and she like went all black, right? So Eric's father was like, you can't do that. And she, you know, she couldn't understand. She was, and he said, you have to understand that we call him student. You know, he's coming from a different, a different um, experience. You know, what he has a lot of white people who support him. He has a lot of white friends. So if you do this, that might make them feel uncomfortable with him. And we had to tell her, you know, being a black man, being a black student, being a black boy, it hits different from anything else, even being a black girl. So we didn't want to put pressure on him from his friends, from his teachers, from, you know, anyone that may know that he's coming from the city to come here. And, you know, so we, we didn't put the black out, right? However, he, it, this does represent him. Police brutality does represent him. Um, um, inequality for black men does represent my son. And, you know, on, on justice, you know, violence against him represents him. So he, at some point, has to stand for who he is, but also not make his environment uncomfortable. Um, I wanted to say something about like me being um, kind of Hispanic and black, I usually get mistaken for just being black. Like people don't see the Hispanic side of me. Um, and sometimes I kind of, I kind of feel like a small bit offended because I like there's some Spanish music I listen to. There's some, um, like, the music is a big part of me because I only usually listen to, um, like, rap music or R&B. But then when I'm at home, I listen to Spanish music with my mom or on a car ride or on a trip or something. And um, people only see me as the kid that, the kid that's black in this in the class. So it's just hard for me to 
para un misión de un salón con una gran personalidad de salón una mamá. About Ruby Bridges, and I would hear how brave she was on going through that mob of people who didn't want her there, and she would keep her head up high, and she would never look back, and she would just go straight into that school, even though a lot of people didn't want her to. So that made me feel like I was powerful, and that black people can do more than they are meant to do. The last video we have for you is a read aloud of the book, The ABCs of Black History, written by Rio Cortez. It shares important words and powerful emotions as we journey through that book. The ABCs of Black History is the best way to end our celebration as it shows us the importance of honoring our past and to inspire the future. So the last thing that I want to do is talk too much because I want to give you know the Board of Education an opportunity to talk with our group. Um, ultimately, we have been so fortunate to have the support of the Board of Education of the district. When you think about CRSE, it's been a big rock. It's been one of the most uh, ongoing, sustaining big rocks over the course of the past five or six years, at least as long as I've been principal of Burnaby. And it's been great to watch our community grow together, to go from um, hearing about it, learning about it, engaging our students and our families in that work. I'm grateful that I have a building planning team. Can I just have my building planning team members who are here? Can I just, so I have my parent member, um, I have a parent member, I have some teachers here tonight, and they've really been championing the folks. I think that it's really important that I say uh, thank you to them because they've been the ones bringing forth these ideas and making sure that we're engaging with our family. Uh, they have a great relationship with each other. We also have some families um, students and families of the past here tonight because we've been engaging in this work with color. So ultimately, um, I am just so grateful to work with our students of color, our families of color, on making sure that their voices are represented as we engage in this work. So again, just thank you for asking us to come down and, and talk. If there's anything you want to say or ask, please. <laughs> So, what do you think of Mr. Kayaz's shirt there? Oh, I love that shirt. Do you want to know who made this shirt for me? Who made that shirt? Who did? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Are you making them available? They are. <laughs> so, I'd like to hear from some of the students. What's your favorite thing about uh, being a student at part of the school? What's your favorite thing? Just so want to answer that question for me. Uh, My favorite thing that we have Burnaby is everybody here. Uh, is everybody at Burnaby to come for the conference? Oh, nice. Oh, that's a great question. Anyone else? Come on. We have a problem with you. Come on. <laughs> Let me change. Okay. okay. That's Joshua's favorite music. Anybody else? 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 Anybody um, my daughter's been at Burnaby since first grade, and so now she's in the fourth grade. And I say one of the, the um, one of my favorite or most significant things is um, communication. Um, the communication is always very steady and available. Um, 
teacher and you know, Mr. Kayak and send an email and then within a couple hours you're getting a response and if there's a concern that needs to be addressed, uh, it's almost immediate, you know. And so I do like the response time. I like that they care about my daughter. If my daughter's going through a hard time and I call up the teacher and say, hey, her pet just passed away, which happened, or this just happened, so she's had a rough morning. Could you talk to her for me or just be mindful and the, the school counselor and psychologist, you know, they're just there to help the student. And I think that's very important for my daughter's social emotional growth and just her development um, in addition that is unique to her. Well, I can say that you're very engaging. You teach us and then to the guys. I'm sorry. Having that open dialogue between parents and staff at school is so important and it does so much for students. When students see that, the parents and, and staff at school have a positive open relationship, that just brings everybody closer, it makes everyone stay in the fire. So that's good to hear. Any other parents? What's your favorite thing about being a Burnaby parent? Mr. Kayaka? <laughs> <laughs> I'll comment on that too. Um, We've been a Burnaby family for, I don't know, almost 17 years. Um, when we came in, we're a biracial family. It, it's been quite the adjustment over, especially I think the last seven to eight years, just seeing the kids get more involved and become more engaged in the communication between home and school. It's just really, really nice to see. And um, also the way that we're, we're not treated differently we don't feel different. Um, they made us feel very comfortable. Um, my son last year was his first year and that was one of his concerns. Um, there's not a lot of kids that look like me um, and my hair is different. And he came home and he told me, mom, they didn't treat me different. And he made a lot of friends. And so we're just happy that we feel like a part of the community, not like, you know, so we're accepting like that. As a visual, I noticed that it looks like some of have to do a little work on data counselors and connecting to the leaders. Did any of you here tonight do a report on somebody famous and want to share who you did a report on? Maybe one of the people. That wasn't a report, that was we asked them to read a book or a page um, out of a book each day for the month of. Um, Black History Month, so they were each asked if we would take, be able to tape them from a page. So each one was a famous Black person that made a difference in American history. Um, does anyone remember who they read? Grayson, would you read? Yeah. Say a little louder. Well, Marita. Oh. Did you read one? Yeah. Do you remember who? You read with treason? Yes. <laughs> it took us a long time before we would get up on that stage and talk. About it. <laughs> so we know where you're going. So, how this came to be was I think it was our snow day. Mm -hmm. um, I had stopped in Berkeley and Mr. Piazza and I were walking around the building and he was sharing with me inside um, all of the planning that had gone on around Black History Month, but many of the other initiatives. And uh, collectively, we thought it would be really wonderful to honor all of the hard work and planning of our teachers and uh, Mr. Piazza, but also the work of our students. And I think today, for me, what's really touching my heart is this concept and this really desire of wanting to belong and uh, making sure that all of our students and our families feel like they belong because we are one school community. And 
So I just wanted to thank everyone who works really hard every day to make sure that our children feel safe and that they belong and that they are connected. Um, and it's just fun to send me to that. So thank you so much. Can I? I would like to thank Reverend Isaac also for making Berkeley such a bright spot in our district and the work and time and effort we put in. And um, most importantly, with the new work students and staff at Berkeley, I would like to thank all of them for being here tonight. You know, um, it's great to see people in person again, uh, seeing students here and the great things that are happening at Berkeley. We really appreciate your time and effort coming in here tonight. So, staff members, parents, students, thank you so much for making Berkeley such a great spot. It's such a um, it's such a strength in our district, and our learning community really appreciates all that you do as a group to make Berkeley an outstanding school. Thank you so much. I really you. You know, with that, I want to do something that you guys probably never had in a big auditorium. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about that, just doing the motion from down there. Yeah. We're going to be heading back down <laughs> Mr. Allen, you, you'll share and convey when uh, Ms. Brown makes her, her, her vote. If we can't hear very well. So, so we have students for the consent agenda? Yes. Yeah. Okay, for, for students for participation with government, um, what we do is, is consent agenda is a, a list of items that have been reviewed and understood and, and um, more administrative in nature, where rather than discussing each one and having uh, an individual vote, we have a single vote on what is called consent agenda, which looks like it has uh, seven items in the consent agenda. So with that, do I have a motion to approve consent agenda? I'd like to make a motion to approve consent agenda. First, Mr. Kincaid, second, Mr. Bracken. All in favor of approval of consent agenda? Ms. Brown? There we go. Are you hearing me? Yep. Okay. I'm a no. So we've got five yeses, one no. Thank you. President's report and communication. Um, I, I just want to share my, my appreciation to the board for, for taking a, a yet another day of their, their evening of their time. Uh, we had a, a great learning event at the BOCES um, Learning Center, um, a communication learning session for, for the board. Um, I think it was very productive and, and we got to hear a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that personal items that we didn't know about and that was kind of an awesome thing to, to hear about people and I won't share it all because some people might not want all of it out. It was fun though. Okay, that's all I have for President's report. <laughs> um, the only thing that I have, I have one item. I attended the uh, district safety committee meeting um, last Tuesday, March 1st. And just a couple of items. We um, did receive a lot of updates in regards to um, district security, um, some updates with our security assessment, which we'll be hearing more about soon. And also a big part of our conversation um, was in regards to the safe, safety plan, as well as the code of conduct and some of the work we'll be doing uh, moving forward. And of course, uh, you'll be getting updates on that uh, within the next month or so. 
would that work? So those were some of the topics of discussion during that meeting. Um, other than that, I'm good. Okay, from uh, MCSBA, um, we talked about the governor's budget last week in legislative affairs committee. Um, one of the big items in there, Rick, I don't know if you've seen this, but it's it's getting a lot of attention, although I don't believe it's gonna go too far, but this transition to electric buses thing, um, pretty much believe that's gonna be a non-starter just because they can't build them and the infrastructure that we would need for it is just not possible, so. But it's out there and it's gonna get some, some play and stuff. Um, information exchange tomorrow, featuring our superstar comms director and a couple of her colleagues from Gates and Churchville. And then the architect firm's uh, interviews are tomorrow and Thursday night. Um, I'll just add a reminder to the board. It is music in our schools month. And on Thursday, we have a music in our schools concert. It's a great event for people who haven't been or haven't been in a few years. It's um, just a culmination of a variety of our musical groups from throughout the district. And it's always impressive. So that is at 7 p.m. here in the pack on Thursday. Um, if you can't make it to that, maybe you're going to the St. Patrick's Day Parade, where I understand our very own drum line will be performing. So that's another exciting musical event. And also our middle school uh, musical is coming up next um, Friday and Saturday. So get your tickets for that. So do we need tickets for the first event you mentioned? The music in our schools concert? Nope, that is open for all. Right here, right here. yep. Awesome. Just real quick, I just I did like the board retreat we had. I think we should do them like early. I got. So I, I've got one other thing I, I wanted to share. Um, I received a, a letter from um, a lecturer with the Education Administrative Program at SUNY Brockport, and I just want to give share uh, a, a shout out that was provided um, about our Mr. Zinkowicz. Um, and his support that he has for that program. And I just want to read um, two of the, the, the sentences in here. Ty is a great role model for future school leaders and an excellent spokesperson for your district, Spencer Ford. Um, he provides students with meaningful tasks to examine the, the district. I'm grateful for the support that, that Ty and Spencer Ford School District has provided. So with that, Ty, thank you so much for, for, for representing the school and, and, and sharing your, your knowledge and ex expertise. It's, it's awesome. So thank you so much. That was from David Dimbleby from a lecturer with the ed Educational Administrative Program at Truman Brockport. Thank you, Ty. All right, next on our agenda is superintendent's report. And I think we're gonna be heading back into the audience. So we have um, our robotics, a range of robotics um, leaders here tonight. Uh, the, the board had um, identified this as an area just to learn a little bit more about, just to give some context. Um, you know, certainly we know that we've got a great uh, program and a strong, successful program, but as with anything, COVID really changed how we participate um, in extracurricular activities and particular robotics. So tonight our presentation will give a little bit of where the robotics team has been and how they weather through our COVID experience and what they're looking forward to. Okay, so if we wanna go down. Hi Sharks, I'm Liv, I'm a senior and it's my fourth year on the team. I'm Abra, I'm a senior and it's my first year on the team. I'm Clarice, I'm a senior and this is my fourth year on the team. 
We are so excited to be on this special edition of Shark Tank, where we would like to share with you our passion for FIRST Robotics, the relationships we have created, and the sustainability of our program. We are seeking seven minutes of your time, and in exchange, we would like to tell you all about our program. Here on Ranger Robotics, one of our favorite sayings is stronger together. Over the past three years, we have had 16 junior FLL, 15 FLL, and two FRC teams. This progression of programs allows for all of our older Ranger Robotics members to go back and mentor all of our younger teams. But that's not all sharks. We also host summer camps for all students in our district and present them with the opportunity to continue robotics by joining one of these FLL or junior FLL teams for the fall. I bet you're thinking, how do we spread first outside of our district? Well, let me tell you about our relationship with Team 7299. Five years ago at the championship, a member of 3015 met a teacher from Mexico who was interested in starting his own first team. We helped them start with an FRC and FTC team. Their team was able to visit us in 2019, but unfortunately their visit got canceled in 2020. We loved being able to show them our school, our community, and our warehouse. Our warehouse, Western New York Area Robotics Experience, is a rented out practice space that we share with two neighboring school districts. Here we have a full-size practice field along with machines and workspace. We invite other teams to practice on our field and we even host team events. Our team is not here to watch the Super Bowl. We are so grateful for the support we receive from our school to have a space like this to sustain our relationships with other teams. This year we held our third annual STEAM Day. For this event, we guided the elementary students in our district through an enrichment lesson. With limited supplies, teams had to creatively work together to build the biggest tower they could. Previous lesson topics that were also based on New York State science standards include velocity and gravity. We are proud to have reached all 1,551 elementary students across all four elementary schools in the district. Similar to past years, four of our 3015 seniors took on the responsibility that this event entails. They coordinated with administrators, organized schedules, planned the challenge, and prepared our team to teach the lesson. We were thrilled by the excitement and passion shown by the elementary students, and we aim to continue STEAM Days each year. Aside from STEAM Days, we created Girls Empowered in Math and Science, or GEMS. This is a club created for and specifically designed for girls. This allows for girls in our district to exper experience our projects in a different way. By starting this club seven years ago, we have seen a massive increase in female participation in robotics. We are very proud that Ranger Robotics is 61% girls. You may be wondering how else you could possibly cultivate more inspiration in math and science. Pondering the subject ourselves, we created STEM kits. Including all necessary materials and instructions, we sent these highly interactive kits to schools in 14 different states, the Holy Cross School in Makanda, South Africa, and in combination with blankets to hospitals. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, this endeavor has led to a new relationship with TeacherGeek, a locally based company that manufactures STEM activities. We are currently working together to develop a new 3015 kit of our own design. Many of our connections from these STEM kits have also evolved into relationships. The Holy Cross School specifically has become our close partner. One of our 3015 alumni traveled to the school, bringing our STEM kits with her through an organization called Love Must Act. And you're gonna like this sharks because they've reused our kits over and over. So we are planning to send them new kits especially paired with our own instructional videos and curriculum online lessons within the coming months. In June 2014, a Spencerport family tragically lost their four-year-old son, Drake. They started Dreams from Drake, a nonprofit organization that helps children and teens who have lost a family member. By fate, 3015 members happen to be at the same location as the foundation's first meeting. We have since provided all the volunteers for their two main uh, events of the year, the birthday bash and the winter gala. We have helped this organization raise over $10,000 and we are very honored that Drake's siblings are a part of the Ranger Robotics family. Robopalooza is my favorite outreach event of the season. We invite the whole Spencerport community to our high school gym, where we have a full-size practice field set up along with stations for each sub-team. Kids can make their own button, cad their own fidget spinner, and even drive the robot. I remember the first time I went to Robopalooza, I wasn't interested in joining robotics at all, but after watching three members present chairmans, I knew this is what I wanted to do. Now here I am five years later. We owe so much to the support of our Spencerport community. The Spencerport Board of Education's constant effort has garnered us so many advantages for our ever-growing program. This year, as in past years, we demonstrated our robot at a sectional basketball game in our gym. It was very exciting to see our robot shoot a basket and be cheered on by the crowd. We were proud. Um, um, we felt this event was a great way to promote an electronics drive we are holding for the Holy Cross School, as well as involve our community in our progress as we approach competition season. 
Seeking to make robotics accessible to all, we are always promoting robotics within our school and community, whether it be on the morning announcements as directed by Clarice, at sports events, or via social media. We, are, we value the, uh, the variety of backgrounds of our students. Our students also participate in band, chorus, sports, drama club, and so much more. You will notice as we have shared with you our passion, sustainability, and relationships, it has revealed what is truly so important to us, the people that make up Ranger Robotics. Thank you, Sharks, for listening to our pitch. Sounds bad. It's okay. They all saw it. What, what, what's, I, I wasn't here for the, the competition. What, what is it about this year? Oh, this year there is a central hub with a low and a high goal. And we have to shoot game pieces into the low goal for one point or the high goal for two points. And the end game is a climb, but it's like monkey bars that increase in height. So um, our robot reaches the traversal rung, which is the highest one. Um, yeah, that's the game. And as always, we pair with other robots. Like we have a team of three, we have an alliance. So as always, it's like, we're always we're working together with people. When is the, the Saturday? Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we have our first competition. Um, we leave Thursday just to practice, and then we will compete Friday and Saturday. And then we have Sunday off, and we go straight to Albany um, Monday through Wednesday. And then we have a little bit of time, but the next week after that, we leave for Cleveland. So that's Tuesday through Saturday. And hopefully Texas over spring break if we qualify for Worlds. Yes. You'll be there. I just want to compliment all of you on your presentation yeah. skills. That was absolutely incredible. Was. The, everything was so good. I couldn't be any more impressed with, with the presentation you just gave. I'm just curious to know, you're all seniors, is that correct? Yes. yes. Um, has robotics, your involvement in robotics, um, swayed you in terms of uh, your career plans or your college? Yes, so I actually am going to be um, majoring in business, and I never would have thought I would do that, but uh, I joined marketing, and Merm kind of helped me find my passion for that. I really enjoy public speaking. I enjoy the marketing aspect of everything, so that's why I'm doing that next year, and I'm so happy that I have this experience. I actually joined robotics this year for the first time, but I'm interested in, I started programming this year because of an internship I have at RIT. So I was excited to kind of join the programming side of robotics and learn it in a different context. Um, so it has definitely influenced me to have more of an uh, interest in engineering because I'd like to major in physics and astronomy, but it's definitely like um, helped me confirm that this is what I want to do. Yes, Abra's like the coolest person ever. She like co-authored a paper at RIT. Like she's incredible. I can't say enough good things about it. <laughs> <laughs> and for you? Oh, I'm planning on um, being a lawyer someday. I'm a pre-law major. And um, robotics has given me a lot of confidence in public speaking because just interacting with people who, um, like judges or people that um, are higher up than me, I was not confident doing that when I started robotics freshman year. And now I feel very comfortable. I feel like I can talk to anyone. Have the three of you um, made final decisions? Yeah, as to where you're going. I have. School. I committed um, to play lacrosse at Emanuel College. It's in Boston. I'm very excited. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to Cornell. Congratulations. Um, I haven't committed yet, but I am set on going to Geneseo. So. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. That, that's awesome. Now, with your competition this weekend, it's at RIT. Um, do you is there a schedule, or do you know what times that you'll be competing? Or is that a, kind of an open-ended question? For our presentation, we are given the chance to um, sign up, I believe, on Thursday. We get to okay. put the time slot. Okay. But as far as our robot yeah, goes, our robot. I believe it's, it's random, right? So, um, but you can go on bluealliance.org, I think it is, and um, you can just search in Team 3015, and you can actually watch our match from online. Thank you. Yeah. Is there going to be a robot? 
I hope so too. I want to come. It's fun. I'm curious about the um, the STEM day when you're talking about building the towers. I love those kind of activities. What were the supplies that the students got to use this year? For the they had popsicle sticks and a little bit of tape and a dream. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For the older grades, they had binder clips and they didn't get the tape, so they had to like um, work on how they were going to use the binder clips to like. Uh, switch the angles of the popsicle stick so that they could stand up by themselves. So it was an interesting challenge. I have a school. Go ahead. Well, I, um, when Mr. Galina and I were talking and he was telling about the time frame, he thought it would be great to have this presentation <laughs> and to have it be a really authentic practice opportunity. But as I was watching you, and I agree, it was a wonderful presentation. Could you just when I think about robotics and you see the match in the robot, but this is such an important piece too. How, could you just explain how it plays into the competition and um, the whole experience? Yeah, so we're kind of on the people side of robotics, but we also go to the warehouse and we try to observe um, the robot as well. I'm actually on programming, so I do do quite a bit of robot stuff too. Um, so I get to kind of dabble in both sides, the uh, public speaking aspects and the marketing aspects and the robot parts, but we all come, come to the warehouse mm -hmm. on Saturdays and like watch practices. Um, Our like team that. is unique. Not every team has a chairman's presentation. Not everyone is able to, or not every team does the community service and outreach that we do. So being a part of 3015 is such a privilege because we have, I know very little about robots but i could tell you all about everything else that we do outside of it so that i know it's that's not the case for every team based on funding community services and they just don't have the time or anything like that so have, have you all been to a world competition i have i did not go to world this I've been, yes, I've been once. It's quite an experience. It's a lot. There's a lot going on. Um, you get to meet a lot of new people. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and especially being on this marketing aspect, um, it's a lot of like talking to people, kind of telling them about your team, um, showing them like who we are and what we want to accomplish and our goals. Still do the paper airplanes? <laughs> <laughs> Always the kid will sneak a few rings in, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I, I had the honor to, to join um, the, the team to go to St. Louis years ago, and it was the most exciting time that I had. And, and I hope you all three have a chance to, to, to do that. I'm pretty confident that you'll be there for the exciting Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, girls. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, thank you so much. Just run with it. 
the shark, the outfit. It, it was absolutely perfect. It was, awesome. <laughs> it was good. I don't know what they cost us, but I'm sure they did. <laughs> I get the bills later. Uh, so thanks for having me. I was asked to come over and, and just talk a little bit about what the state of the union is for robotics. I wonder if some of the people that's on the board now, uh, and Ms. Swan that's here, and you know where we started, what was the impact of COVID, and what do we need to recover from it? Because we were at a point where 300 kids in the program, just like anything, you know, COVID's and they're like, this is not the world. And we lost a lot. You know, we learned a lot too. So we, we did gain some. But talk about like, how we're going to recover, get our numbers back, and what was the need to sustain this? Because as you see, robots are awesome. We build really good robots, but there's a lot that goes into that as well. And we're a program that's more than just building robots. Uh, we're the total package for a program. You know, and, and one of the slides up there is what is it going to be? What does it take to be world class? That was a world class presentation from high school. These high school girls, it really, really was. Now you're going to get the tech teacher who can't work tech. So just to let you know that. Uh, I was sitting at the world champion, Kevin, probably when you went with us. Dean came in at the closing ceremony, always goes, oh, come on, Mr. Camina. Bobby, this is what I usually do when I'm in here doing it. There we go. Uh, he always gives us homework, and Dean came as the founder of the first, right? And he, he likes to make it entertainment, right? They'll have athletes there. Uh, they'll have people in the music industry there, right? They're trying to keep it hip for the kids, right? Uh, you think robot competition, you think these robot kids are walking around, right? Our team's a little bit different. We have all types of uh, different types of kids in our program. But he said something to me that just really, really stood with me. And it's, I want you guys to transform our culture by creating a world where science and technology are celebrated, where young people dream of becoming science and technology. That's the truth. Okay? People get celebrated all the time for bouncing a ball, singing a song. We need thinkers and doers in this world. And I try to get them from the youngest age possible. We just try to show them something. You could spark something in a kid. You never know. There's going to be a time, and this is going to be me rambling a little, but a kid is going to go through for his robotics and make their thing. He's going to work in Walmart. It's going to happen. We have special people. Just look at the girls that just were here. And we need to celebrate this type of people. And I always say, here's the history, right? I remember, you can stop holding this picture. Remember we had digital you know, cameras? We never knew how to really change the date. <laughs> 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 no, I had those cameras, right? This is 2008. And I remember sitting, and this was a big time in my life. Uh, I remember in the fall, I was coaching at Churchill Child Football, and we had the number one ranked football team in the state. And I was going into the fall, and I was on the wrestling program here. We were ranked in the country. And that was an obvious sports guy. I'm like, oh, boy, this is awesome, right? So a guy approaches me at an open house, and he's like, hey, man, did you ever hear about this thing called first robotics? I'm thinking, come on, buddy, football coach, first robotics. I'm a good job teacher, first robotics. So in typical fashion, me and young Tim O'Connor, if you guys see him up there, uh, we said, sure, we'll do it. Me and Timmy were like, hey, man, we'll just tag team. You go one day, I'll go one day. All right? So long story short, those 17 kids and those four or five adults in that picture turned into that in just 10 years. So we had a goal what we're going to do. How can we get from point A to point B? And we started the young programs. So I work with Christina Bowerman. Our community ed person, we started right at the low level. We're going to say, let's build this program just so we can do sports program. And I learned a lot. I used to coach with Bill Jack and tell so you got to get a dunk before anybody else can. So we implemented our junior at low program, K through four. First year, we did the first one with my kids in kindergarten in my, in my living room. We had a couple families over. We had Next year, Christine and I tag teamed. Uh, we had, I don't know, 60 kids. Next year, we had 132 kids on the wait list. Right? This is what people want, and I think they're learning. I'm guilty of it. My kids play travel soccer, they play baseball, basketball, same thing probably all your kids do. But I want my kids to do this. I want my kids to do this. Uh, and I always say, how much smarter would I get to play football? Okay, right? Like, I want our kids to do that. And, that. and that picture was taken random. We said, hey, everybody here. And it's just like Friday. Everybody here tomorrow. There's probably like another people that are not in that picture. Uh, that was pretty awesome. That's all our age groups and a lot of our adults, a lot of our mentors. Uh, just a little history, but the one thing I always say to people, like every kid will throw an arm. 
our sport. That's a big deal, right? It doesn't, we don't push everyone to be engineers. We don't want that, right? That's that pigeon hole you into a certain kid. We want people that are going for pre law. We want people that are going into business. We want engineers. We want doctors. We want lawyers. Right? No other program in this school district is going to bring so many different types of people together. If you lined up the basketball team, the wrestling team, the band, you would say, that's a band kid, that's a basketball player. You look at 3015 Ranger Robotics, you couldn't tell them to walk around. There's just so many different types of kids that we bring in. Uh, just for the new people, I'll be real quick with this. This is like a progression. I always say when I say, put those acronyms with Junior FL and FLL. When you think our junior your program, this is a little low. You don't care about robotics at that point. Well, they're about to see the they're just walking in front of me. That's what they really do. That's how they get to those girls that were up there, right? The sooner we can get that confident in their public speaking, the, the sky's the limit them, right? Okay, I can do this. Now I can design a robot. We, we show them they got one motor, one sensor, but the real victory is working with our high school kids and working with the other adults that help out to get them to where they're at. Then they graduate into their first little competitive. That's the junior FL. My two boys run the Burnaby Junior FL team this year. Uh, this is their first little look at uh, sensors and motors and paint. And then there's a chairman aspect of it. The program progresses all the way through. Uh, the up top right, that's FTC. We dabbled in this a few years because of this story. Seventh and eighth graders are too cool to be on the robot Lego team. So we wanted to get them going into some uh, some real robots, they've done a 12 by 12 field plot. It's becoming kind of a little bit of a graphic. The season started in September, and our real varsity season starts in January. And it was really big mentor, mentor burnout. We're like, going a long, long time. And the program only allows you to have 16 kids on it, so we really couldn't have that. Uh, that was becoming a problem. And then our varsity team is the FRC, that's the 120 pound robots. Before, and this is the number. Before the pandemic, we had to create two FRC teams because we had over 100 students, one robot. That's unheard of around the country and the world. Probably only a few handful of teams. They have two varsity teams coming out of their high school. We just had to do it. We just had the numbers of kids, and we needed we needed just to get kids hands on robots. We're always preparing them. Uh, we're always going to graduate our best kid. I would say that. We're always graduating our best kid. We need to definitely keep that that train going. Uh, you know, you've seen the accolades. The big thing about us is we're going to build great robots. That's our goal. We want to be the world champions every year. It's a luck that all the balls got to bounce their way. But our biggest thing is we want to build great people. And, you know, uh, what they do in the schools, who cares what blue banners you put on the wall winning robot competitions? If you can spark your kids' interest at a young level uh, and get them, you know, it's continuous, right? You're going to bring your friends. And you never know, like I said, that kid five, six, seven, eight years from now. He's hopefully he's on the cover of Time Magazine. No, it's going to happen. One of the biggest things I always think they hang my hat on is $1,725,000 in college scholarships through first robotics. So when your awesome daughter gets their college package, it says first robotics scholarship, $50,000, right? That's through this program. And that is uh, partnered with many schools around the country, four or 500 schools around the country offer first robotic scholarships. I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers that I could come at the end of this year and say, hey guys, we have $2 million in college scholarships through first robotics. I'm hoping uh, that's gonna get done, right, Nance? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so pre-COVID participation. Uh, I still remember what like, you guys do. It's March 13th. We literally loaded in to RIT. The pit went up. The robot got on the We had no leads on the phone. Yo, I'm sending a bus to come get you. We're shutting it down. Computer first one to cancel. Open this first day to cancel. Yep. Yeah, that was, that was that day we were at the event. So we had two FRC teams. We had 30, 15, 27, 16, and I know I'm throwing numbers out to you. That means we were the 3,015 team to sign up for first. Now we're in the 9,000s. Okay, so that's what that means. And at 27, 16, our JV team, they give you a number that's sort of close to your original program. But like I said, there's 9,000 teams. So some have folded, some are still going, but we're in the 3,000s. So at that point, we had, you know, 120 high school students 
into one of our elementary schools and have them each have an FLL team, uh, we can't advertise that program. That just happens. If we advertise, we would have 20 of them. Uh, so there's kids that are left home on a wait list. We just can't do it. Uh, and then our junior FLL team at the peak that fall 2019 in her department, we were able to have 102 students at Cosworth once a week for 12 weeks. Uh, it was pretty awesome. That was K4. So post-COVID participation, just like every program in the school district, people kind of found other stuff to do, right? So this year, we had to make a decision in the fall that we were not going to run 27-16 this year, our uh, JV first program, just because of numbers. And the biggest thing was our mentors. Right, our mentors with our volunteers to help us out, our engineers from industry. Uh, they're the ones that really, uh, you know, kind of guide them. We just didn't, we just, burnout was just going to become an issue. Uh, we weren't able to run our junior FLL in the fall. Uh, we might still do it in the spring. It was just that, you know, we were opening schools. We didn't really know what was going to happen. So we decided we worked together and said, you know, we'll push it off to the, to the spring and maybe we can do that. So that, that's her, that's our feeder program. We were still able to, uh, to have 58 students or seven FLL teams happen in one in the elementary group and four at Kajwa. We were still able to do that. But, you know, that'll come back. Our biggest asset, I believe, is our environment for a number of reasons. Uh, Joe Galena, Nancy Van was only one person with all those <laughs> kids. Uh, Pre COVID, you know, we had 89 adults volunteering. When I say volunteering, guys, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of hours. Okay. Uh, after COVID, we had 60. And the big reason before that is yeah, last year we had robotics. But it was like, okay, adults can't come into the school, right? They yeah, weren't district employees. So we kind of had to work with them around and promote stuff. It just wasn't the same. Uh, first, they, they pushed the program out as FRC at home, using kind of the same little constraints as the previous year's games. So there wasn't a lot of new stuff that was going on. Uh, but we managed to do really well. We, you know, we, we really embraced it. I was super proud of the kids and the adults that, hey, we're, we're going to put our best foot forward and we're going to, we did okay last year. All right, also an impact of having sponsors. This is, this is something that is becoming a very, very, very big deal for us. And you can look at those numbers, they're, they're huge numbers, but there's a downward trend happening. And you guys, you guys know that business is not giving up. It's a very unstable economy, uh, stuff is costing more, and we're not getting it in. Uh, registration fees are being set. Robot fees are going to be up, right? If you try to buy anything on China, our more robots sometimes. We need five of each. Uh, everything's costing a lot more money. So at the peak of our, our sponsorship, we had $51,000 in corporate sponsorship. Uh, this year we had 35. We lost some big ones and they went radio to the pandemic. Uh, and this is a, a little bit different graphic that means the exact same thing as this. That last slide. So 2020, that was the back of our t-shirt. So if you know anything about a program, the back of the t-shirt like an ass, right? Big sponsors on the top, big money on top. Uh, you can tell that that's a lot more crowded on the left than on the right. It's tough. It's becoming tough to get anything out of these guys. Uh, the, affordable, the affordable graphics guy there, he just did our trailer for free, free graphic trailer. So we put him on there, but it's, it's just becoming uh, a little bit difficult to bring money in. This is our budget, and all these numbers are going to be 2019, 2020, just because you know, we're kind of in an outlier year here. So our budget is about 113,000. It's a small business that we're going. And 70,000 of the student travel, and you know, kids pay for their travel, but there's a lot of times we do scholarship kids. We'll never leave a kid behind for money, right? That's what our sponsors for, and that's what helps us get through it. All right, so I was asked, like, hey, what are some recommendations that can really help you guys continue uh, moving forward? And I'm just going to go over a few things that I think that would be really, really helpful that I think is a necessity. Uh, this is almost like a plea for help because it's becoming hard to get through stuff. First thing, we need to move from a club to a team. And I put up there, teams have budgets, clubs have pizza parties. There's nothing wrong with clubs. They're awesome. But if you meet with a club, you meet once a month, you guys get together during activity period, and you find your way out the door, right? Do something else. 
That stat over there, 5,711, that's what was a week and a half ago when I started this. That's the amount of man hours that's gone into the robot so far this year, January 8th. That's a big number. Now, there's a shift change that happens at this school, and I say this a lot, uh, but if you're not here, you don't see it. So, ding, 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 the bell goes off at 220, everyone leaves the building. 250, robots comes in until nine o'clock every day of the week. That's a whole shift change. So those teachers that have been working from 7 a.m., you don't leave until nine years. That's a long time, right? We need a direct advocate. We don't have, and I'm gonna use football as an example of that I know. John Dow does never has to never has to worry about his bus being there, his grass being cut, brand new football helmets, security guards with their yellow shirts, the lights going on. He never has to worry about that. I have to worry about raising money just to walk through a door. Right, just to walk through the door at a first robotics event is fifteen thousand dollars. If we, if companies go radio silent, we don't have a first robotics team. We need a line budget. We really do. And we've been having this conversation for years, and it's just becoming tough. It's becoming a part of my job. Constantly worrying about do we got money because that fifteen thousand dollars hits you in the door. It does not build you a world class robot. World class robots are very, very expensive. We need to help out some of these. We have guys here that are volunteering thousands of hours for free. They don't make anything. We're going to lose people. So big thing, we need to be a team, not a club. I took these numbers from Board of Education staff in 2019, 2020. Uh, and this is just comparing, and I, these are category one sports, soccer, football, wrestling, and the last one I just combined. And this is just a comparison of the number of participants, 9-12, number of coaches we have, coaches' salary, and what the ratio of people are, right? We're traveling with 91 kids. We get three coaches, make $7,600 here. I need more coaches. I do. We're going to lose great people. We are, I'm telling you. Uh, it already started. We're going to lose great people. Uh, we put in just as much, maybe probably more, time than those guys. And I'm not taking anything away from them. Sports is very, very important. But at some point, we need to kind of like make a little action going on here. We, we need to. You know, yes. Your season's like all your world, I mean, theory. So I was only comparing this to our varsity season. I didn't want to do the whole year long thing. You are correct. Right. But I wanted to go, you know, apples to apples kind of deal, right? Our season's a lot longer. We travel further away, overnights, that kind of stuff. But I wanted to wanted to compare what our numbers are. Compare. I didn't put you know we're a baseball program. I didn't want to put uh, modified stuff in there just because there's a few outliers with coaches' salaries that'll really throw that up on those modified levels. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, this is it. This is a great program. At some point, we're going to lose great, great people. Uh, we already did. Guy on the left, Alex, no longer with the Scotty Young family. Worked 200 hours last year. I made them clock get in there. I said, Joe, and he was, if you know Alex, he's an emotional man. So I just, I just can't do it anymore. I can't leave my wife. I can't, I can't do it, right? We're trying to start a family, that kind of stuff. Colin, world class robot. Started this career in Texas with 148, the Robo Wranglers. Uh, they build a fence. Their whole, their whole robot's built with a fence plant, right? So he was right there. We have him. He did 325 hours this year. Probably more last year. He didn't even travel yet. He doesn't get paid. Right? He has to. Justin Bontois, you guys probably know him. Not only is he amazing for our team, he actually runs a weekly FRC show that he sits there and talks to other programs around the country, getting ideas, working with their engineers, their mentors, wealth and knowledge. Good looking ball guy in the middle is me. Uh, Nancy. Her husband's here. I was going to say this, but I shouldn't. Nancy won't clock her hours. Okay, she won't clock her hours because she doesn't want Pete to know how many hours she does and what she makes. So, <laughs> sorry, Pete. Now you know. Sorry. Okay. And then Bobby. Uh, Bobby is the biggest example of positivity of this program. 
A lot of you guys probably know Bobby is the guy who sets up your mics, the guy who makes sure the videos work and that kind of stuff. Well, Bobby's a world-class engineer. I don't know if you guys know him. So Bobby started in 2008, he's never left, right? Why is Bobby the perfect example of this program? Because Bobby's worked his way up. Bobby networked and made the right contacts with people at Paris. Bobby graduated college, Bobby probably had one interview at Paris. He got hired with Ken Bobby puts up the stage. If we know that it does, then it will be forever. It's awesome. So I put this on here because one of my recommendations is to put this on the athletic cell. We have to. We have to do something like this. We can't be a club or an activity anymore if we're going to keep these great people. We have to. So it, you guys know it. It takes one, then a second one, then a third one. And next thing you know, we're average. And we don't want to be average. And the reason why I put this up is our current cycles are so low compared. You could be a first year. So last week, I'm so happy that it's happening. But we have proved to have girls play. That's amazing. Another opportunity for kids. I met with Jen and talked about it. She's going to pay their varsity coach or whoever it is, you guys, $4,000. Okay. She's going to pay. These other guys will pay. Nancy? Nancy is group six. The third one over $1,200. Uh, we got to help people out. We're going to lose people. And some of sorry, I apologize. <laughs> okay. We're, go we're going to. We need, we need to, to really figure this situation out. I've been in this room many times, and I have people have said, Joe, this is a flagship program for us. This is a marquee program for us. Guys, like I could coach Modify if I want to next year and make $3,000 more because of my levels of experience than I'm making you robots year round. Okay. Uh, and I don't want you to think that this is a you know, It's not. I, we, I know if this is a marquee program in a world class program, you have to keep people here. We start losing, the blocks start tumbling, it's going to happen. And then people are just going to find other things to do. Uh, I need help. I also need help with registration fees. I do a big part of my day. Nobody else has to worry about entering the door. We do. We just lost all that sponsorship. They decided to go radio silent on me. We're going to lose it. So I took comparative districts. Churchville, Fairport, Penfield, and us, right? Number of students we have, their coaching salaries, and what their district contribution is. So Churchville gives their program 33,000. That cost that covers uh, the cost of registration fees. Fairport, same. Now Penfield, they're in all they give zero dollars. But listen to this stat. Since 2005, L3 Harris has given them 40,000 a year. That's their market their budget and paid engineers. Get six hundred eighty thousand dollars for three years to get it. Ten million since two thousand five. Those guys aren't there anymore. Those big sponsors like that aren't there anymore. I find them. Can't do it. Uh, our district does. You know they pay our sessions and they do give us five thousand dollars for traveling if we make it to the championship. So we got to make it to the championship to get that five thousand dollars. Guys, I need help. I really do. Uh, I don't know what more to say with that. We need help. Bobby, Bobby, L. <laughs> Bobby gets me out of a lot of jams. All right. The last thing is to talk about the dedicated space. If you've ever walked through the tech facilities down here, you'd be like, you guys build world class robots out of this place? Uh, because it also is putting a strain on our tracks. Right. I think this one, you walked in there the other day, they had the room sections. That's in the middle of robot season. That's the only place we have to work. Now we do have the warehouse, which is off. Warehouse is great, but we are sharing that tiny space with three other teams, right? And get, it's not like we can go there and build stuff. Uh, we need space. And we, and we talked about this in the past, you know, and my recommendation would be, use the space you have if you have it. And I always say, hey man, at East High School East Camp looks great for a robot facility, <laughs> right? Uh, we talked about a STEM center at some point, man, we gotta have some vision on it. Don't be in the STEM center, let's go, let's do it. You know, I hear all the time, 
robots and target pass by the by the community on the board of education. And I'm all about do what it takes. I'll knock down doors. We need something. We need to pull in our parking lot. Dude. Boom! There's a Spencer Ford Center. We have to. Not all about football stadiums and basketball courts and swimming pools. You guys got to think about the future. These kids and what's going to happen. That's all fine. We've all had the glory days. But we, we need to put these kids in a position where they can be world class as well. Oops, Bobby. There we go. Uh, and these are just you know just a summary of everything that we have, and everything you know that I think we need to continue growth and continue operating at the status that we have been into the future. And then you know a lot of we talked about we'll be competing this week, and that's a quick turnaround. We got another. Uh, at RIT, and obviously our chairman team is ready. I don't know what level they are. It, hopefully it will be. Then, you know, we go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday we're going to have a little day to wash some clothes, and then we're back 4.30 in the morning. We're leaving for Albany uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, get a week off, and then we'll be competing again in Ohio. Hopefully we can make it to the World Championships this year. Uh, crossing our fingers, you know. Hopefully the kids can put out a good product and do you all proud of them. And, uh, bounce the ball. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I do thank you all for your support that you've given me over the years and the program. Uh, I just hope that maybe you can take a couple of these things in and maybe help us out. I'm telling you, I don't come up here too often and ask for stuff. It's usually celebratory, but I thought that this was a point where we need to really look at what we're doing here. And we've done really well with what we've had, but I'm telling you, the blocks will continue to fall if we, we don't take care of some of these guys that are really crucial to our, our program. So I thank you all very much. Uh, any questions? No? Do you know who RIT? Is there any restrictions on Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. RIT, you know, every kid has to show a vaccination, uh, adults as well, uh, and it is massive. If you do plan on coming out, which I would really love to do, that. kids would love to talk to you guys. Uh, Saturday is hot. If you come out on Saturday, that's what that's what stuff's going on. Uh, uh, the first few days are fall, which is the Saturday is just a price. So do we need to have sorry, card in advance? Yeah, they have a card and they have to wear on the RIT campus, so yes. It's funny though, because we're going to Albany a day later. No vaccine, no mask. <laughs> so, is there a limit at RIT? They are not limiting spectators this year, which is great, as long as you have the vaccination. Else? Joe, thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, thank you for all that you have done and will continue to do. Um, sure. Really appreciate the work you put in to this presentation and most importantly, the work you've done and your mentors and your staff and Z as well for all that you have done to make this a world class operation very special for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have a great week, and I'll keep you guys posted on everything that hopefully it works out well for us.
Maria Doherty. I'm the coordinator of special education for preschool through grade five. I'm Jason. I'm the special education. I'm Sarah, coordinator so I have the privilege of kicking us off with highlighting some pieces, um, some of which you'll hear a lot more about during our presentation tonight and others which we just want to mention to you again as highlights of our year so far. So one of the pieces that we'd like to talk with you tonight about is the expansion of our integrated co-teacher model into seventh grade and how that has gone for us this year. Another piece that you will hear a lot more about today is the implementation and revision of the student intervention plan process in the elementary school. Um, and that has been revamped in order to provide a more collaborative opportunity for our participants. So I'm excited to talk with you more about that later on. Um, a piece that we won't go into a great depth about um, today, but I'm happy to provide you with more information on it, is that we worked as a related services department. So our speech language staff, occupational therapists, and physical therapists worked to develop a framework and a handbook for um, tier one response to intervention as aligned to the multi-tiered support uh, model of a sandbox for our teachers to use with students when they experience some deficit or that's with them teaching with occupational therapy and uh, physical therapy, including uh, process flow charts and documentation to set that up and running. And we were really pleased to share that with all of our staff and so that this is going really well. And then the final piece has been professional development and that we've taken a three-pronged approach to. So one of the pieces has has been around social emotional needs, and we can talk a little bit more about that in our presentation today. The second component has been on addressing specific learning needs uh, for our most struggling students, and this addresses the unfinished learning component of things. So, through that piece, we've offered some like scaffolding, differentiation, and some special design instruction. And then our final problem of professional development has been on the integrated co teaching model and all of the pieces that go along with it. So, how to like skill based school how to collect data and progress monitor, uh, teaching within a resource room setting, as well as a review of all of our case management and um, investment. So, a few of our highlights. So, during uh, Bernie's presentation, Ms. Warren referenced that we were one community, and that's really one of our initiatives that we've been working on for a couple of years now. And um, really, one of our initiatives is increasing inclusion opportunities for our students with disabilities. And uh, it's been one of our intense focus, focuses. And, you know, we look at it through a variety of lenses because inclusion is so important for students with disabilities. Um, there are many benefits of inclusion, in, and it is for both our students with disabilities as well as students in the general population. If you're looking at uh, there's academic benefits, there's social emotional benefits, there's benefits for um, general education teachers. They're learning how to reach and teach more students in their classrooms. Um, but our students, um, it increases their social skills, it increases uh, their self image, which we see a lot of times um, when students are separated from their general educators. And um, it helps with problem solving skills and it really helps with them learning how to respect. We don't take these decisions lightly, though, and you know, and that's why we've been so thoughtful over the years as we've looked at increasing these opportunities because not every student belongs fully included in general education. So when we're making these decisions, we sit at the table and we look at their learning profiles and we use data, and we're really looking at making determinations over what they need to be successful in the setting. And we make sure that we're providing those opportunities with everything that they need. So if they need additional support through teacher support or if they need additional support through assistive technology, those kinds of things, we're making sure that we have that available to them so that they can be successful in this setting. We have lots of different opportunities for them. So we have that integrated co-teaching model that Maria referenced. We have opportunities and electives at the secondary level, special areas. We have work study programs, clubs and athletics, school local, lots of different opportunities um, for our students, and they have been really successful all the way through here. The most critical piece, though, that we find is case management. Our special education teachers, 
they have small case loads. And when I say small, some are bigger than others, but none of them have a case load of more than 20 students. Um, and that allows them to really be able to get to know their students well, um, know their learning strengths, know their needs, and to be able to really critically look at how to help support them in the classroom environment, in the school environment, and really in the community when they're moving out into those work environments, the vocational environments, um, being able to track their parents, understanding um, how they view their students, you know, out at home, in the community, and well, you know, as well in school, you know, in talking about what they think they need to be successful. You know, we take pride in how our teachers work with our students and families to be able to get them what they need. Um, Maria will talk more later. Our elementary teachers, special education teachers, have really worked hard this year um, through our SIP process to take that to the next level to show that. So, student, um, we're going to continue with the, the acronym challenge. <laughs> <laughs> One of the pieces that uh, <laughs> both Andrew and Maria have talked about now, uh, been here for the board meetings that we've presented over the last two years. Over the last three specifically, we've talked about that integrated group teaching model. Um, so, um, when we talk about that, that's that's difficult work. Uh, we've had folks that have been doing, you know, some some very very difficult work. Not only is it a change in logistics, moving from self-contained classroom to self-contained classroom to the ICT model, um, but this is also a, a, an instructional philosophy shift as well. So um, this work doesn't happen in a silo. Um, and, and honestly, the support that you folks have provided to us um, this year, we have. Um, as the TOSA for our K-8 uh, group of special education uh, teachers, but we've also had a relationship with Alan um, Rosetti, who's our instructional uh, coach for Bozes, who's been working with us for several years in preparation for this work um, in order to make this shift um, to provide those more inclusive options for our students. And so some of the things, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail in a few minutes, but um, you heard Maria talk about the professional development that's going on. Um, at both levels, and I, when I talk about levels, I'm kind of looking at it as K-8 and 9-12 right now. That's how we kind of broke up the, uh, the levels of support. But things from the Horton Gillingham work that we've now um, provided to all the teachers, again, you probably remember Horton Gillingham from years past. All of our special education teachers are now trained at the elementary level in Horton Gillingham. Um, at the secondary level, we've been able to do things like um, specific training for special education teachers uh, on certain topics within special education uh, with Helen's help or Bree's help. Uh, we've also, knowing that ICT is something that impacts not only our special education folks, but also our gen ed teachers as well. We've been able to do things like uh, presentations to our library teachers to get them uh, to build their level of understanding of what this entails and, and how they can uh, utilize strategies and techniques to support students in their classrooms as well. So um, this has been something that has been helpful, uh, extremely helpful in allowing us to expand these opportunities Um, over the past three years, like we talked about, we've really been able to increase those opportunities for our kids. Um, when we look specifically at ICT, we now have seven classrooms of, of ICT at our elementary level. We've been able to successfully bring ICT up to six and seventh grade at Cod Grove, and our plan next year is to, to continue to move that with that cohort. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. That one cohort that started in fifth grade three years ago has now moved up and is our current seventh grade cohort. will be eighth grade next year. This is the group that we're talking about here. A uh, great bunch of kids. And, and again, we started with 11 students who came over to us as uh, sixth graders in Tajgo. And Andrew's going to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the data behind this, this program as far. Okay, so as Mike referenced, these students are seventh graders now. And if you remember a couple of years ago, we highlighted these students. They were. Uh, so Mr. Kayaza and I sat in the night school year, and we have been talking for years about making a cohort of 51 students at the COVID grade level. And we had made the decision with the current fourth graders to do it for fifth grade. There were 11 students in that one cohort, that one grade, and they were a fighting group. 
they had been together for quite a few years and they were already not getting along very well. Uh, they were struggling to be in interpersonal relationships. Um, though we knew that academically they had um, some challenges, we knew that they needed to get out of the classroom, out of that self helping classroom. Um, so we said, what better time to do it? We had a great co teaching team in Kathy Wilson and Jane Lopeka. So we knocked on the door and said, if this is our idea, we'll try it. And we said, sure. Knowing that 11 students with disabilities are 11 out of a self contained classroom and into their class. Um, they welcomed it with open arms. And we also split them up. So I was the last time to one teacher, and um, we were able to kind of like short the process, separate them a little bit to break up the seven. Um, but as we follow them, we're going to be able to break them up. Really so not all of them went back. All we, so there were a few of them went, that went into a different classroom, but the most the, the most struggling learners were in the executive phase. And, um, and really out of those 11, so after when they moved from fifth to sixth grade, only two of them were in, in an integrated mode. Because what they really needed was to just get out of self You know, and when they had their these positive role models and they were learning from a multi, you know, multimodal kinds of teaching methods. They were able to get it, which they just weren't getting it before. When, when, even when we went back and looked at the data, we were like, wow. Now it doesn't mean that other kids didn't go into that setting because they did, because they needed that level of support. But it just shows you the fluidity of this kind of a program uh, where these students can kind of come in and out, but still be within the general education setting and still get the special education support that they need. So we haven't gone over 12 in three years. We've been able to maintain the setting. And the kids are doing efficiently. So the quantitative data that Andrea just just shared, that's important. You know, starting with 11 students, three students continued in that ICT program from that original cohort and that original group. Um, that's that's a good barometer to gauge that, that success of the program. But it's also that qualitative, right? One of the biggest things that um, when we're looking to to have more inclusive opportunities for kids and, and having them out of that self contained setting is really that social emotional. When we talk about the interpersonal relationships, one of the things that we need to find all the time is that the kids didn't have their general role models to be able to, to fashion some of those interpersonal relationships and those skills. And so, um, you know, I go back to this other piece about, Dave, you, your reaction was great. Yeah, 11 kids coming into the, to the gen ed city is, is difficult, right? But we've had people that, um, when we started this program last school year in Castro, um, had a great team of folks that, um, generated some ideas, generated some thoughts, you know, this would be, you know, for example, they got after going through sixth grade with this group of, of students in the ICT models that, you know, we really need to have an opportunity to have to touch points with kids on a weekly basis several times throughout the week. So we, we build- One of the biggest focuses of our ICT program is social emotion. Bobby, can you stop that? Thanks, Bobby. Bobby, can you stop It's just, uh, uh, being able to have to build that in. So we've been able to kind of uh, modify and adjust things and now seventh grade uh, with this group and this is Bethany Wolf, who's our, our ICT special education teacher, Courtney Horner, who's one of our gen ed teachers, who teaches science um, in the ICT team. Uh, we've been able to kind of continue to make those adjustments. And again, it goes back to um, having good open conversations, department meetings, uh, utilizing free support, Ellen support, to, to really uh, make sure that we're tailoring this to meet the students' individual needs within this setting. And now that this group has been in, in this, uh, in the gen ed setting for such a long period of time, um, like Andrew said, the, the, the key piece of this is that fluid, being able to then move out to CT sections and, and in some cases, some gen ed sections as well. So um, without further ado, not the ladies.
One of the biggest focuses of our ICT program is social emotional acceptance amongst our peers. How do you think that the identified students are fitting in with their gen ed peers this year? So a lot of our students with IEPs in this class are very, very motivated to work independently and also with their peers. Um, they do not like to be singled out or to have to work on something different from anyone else. So I think that ICT gives them that opportunity to work with all of their peers um, and to be exposed to the content that their peers are also getting this year. Yeah, I think I've definitely seen more self-confidence in them as the year has gone on. I've seen a lot more motivation. They're, they're taking the things that we're teaching them in class, especially about like studying and using them outside of class. They seem a lot more motivated um, to study. And I think also just having those positive role models in the classroom. A lot of them have developed new friendships that maybe they didn't have before. And then also in terms of like discussion and content, like things that they're exposed to, I think they're at a higher level than if they were taught um, separately. They're talking about exposure to content, you know, they're, they're receiving the same content as the rest of the classroom. But when you walk around the class, what you're not noticing, or what the students aren't noticing really, is they might have different work that they're at being asked. And the students aren't being called out as being different. And I think that that's one of the most inclusive measures right there is that their work is at their level. You know, it's <coughs> what they are able to do and they're being successful with it. And what better way to measure inclusion than feeling accepted and like being, you know, feeling successful. All right, so switching gears a little bit, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about our student intervention process. This has been one of the biggest initiatives for elementary special education this year. Um, and it came about, the revision to the process came about from just working with our staff over the course of the past year, listening to them and their needs and what has come through loud and clear across all four of our elementary buildings is that our special education teachers wanted opportunities to work with each other, to pick each other's brains on what kids need and what kids struggle with and what resources we can share among each other. And they wanted to be empowered at that child. And so when we sat and we took a look at the day that the time was provided to us for um, the SIP process at each of the elementary buildings, we thought what a great opportunity this is to change this process to provide our case managers a platform where they can talk about their student, what they've tried with their student, what their student's IEP goals are, and what they're still struggling with, and then partner with their special education colleagues at their building to come up with interventions to support our most struggling special education students. Uh, to get this process going, you see at the bottom bullet, we wrote that the model is aligned to MTSS. So before we rolled out the first the first round of SIP to our teachers, we collaborated with Chris and Paulini in making sure that we're aligning our process to the district's revision of MTSS as a whole. And so while we cannot replicate word for word, because MTSS is a general education um, and, and, and initiative, as you all well know, um, we did take some of those processes and procedures that came through as recommended by Jim Wright, um, who we know that the district has worked with to kind of help revamp some of the MTSS processes. The key change for us has been that while through the MTSS process, a goal is created for the child based on their performance, through our SIP process, we said, why create a goal when the children already have goals in their IEP? So all of the work, all of the interventions, and all of the targets for the kids are designed completely around the goals that are on their IEPs. And so the process for SIP, and there are four SIP days in each four of the, of the elementary buildings, they're spaced out across the district. And so at each SIP meeting, there are four phases. Ahead of the meeting two weeks, the case managers will think about which students on their caseload are not making adequate progress towards their IEP goal, which students are struggling with doing this demand. They'll contact us and give them those, give us those students' names and pull data yeah. for them and create a data spreadsheet. And then at the SIP meeting, the case manager presents on what the students 
terms are what they have tried already, how they're performing as compared to their classmates, and as well as compared to where they should be for their IEP goals. Uh, they present kind of the case of what they want to work on. We follow the MTSS framework and gym rights model in creating a problem identification statement as aligned to where the child should be at this point for their IEP goal versus where they are right now. And then we work together to identify a hypothesis around why the child is not achieving the goal. And that helps us provide a bit of a compass and a direction for brainstorming. We then dedicate about half of the time. We have 30 minutes allocated for each student's discussion. About um, 12 to 13 of those minutes is to collaborate. So let's say that we narrow the focus that a child is not able to, uh, for example, they decode short box sentences, right? Uh, the teachers will then begin to brainstorm with each other different specific strategies that they've tried with other students who they have worked with in the past and what has and has not worked. We write all of these down. Case manager then selects two of the top strategies that they would like to try with their student. Um, progress monitors those over time. And then at the next round of SIP presents on how the student has performed after implementing those interventions and whether that has worked or not. Um, this year, we are addressing academic issues for um, through our SIP process. So you know that, that many of our special education students struggle with academic needs, but there are some who also struggle with behavioral needs. Uh, we have made the decision not to address behavior this school year, but that is a piece that's coming for next year as MTSS branches into focusing on behavior next year as well. So we'll be doing that on this piece and align to um, what the district is doing that way. And so that kind of transitions pretty well over to what other way you've been supporting behavior and that is continuing that. So we, um, it was very apparent in the first month or so of school that we had some students who were really um, struggling to reacting to the general education setting uh, and being in a classroom full time. You know, it's a big shift to go from four days to the next little midway break that they had last year. Um, and we really knew that we needed to support behavior, but we weren't ready to do it through SPSS and we weren't ready to do it through SIPCAP. So we found our own um, method of reaching some of our NPS students in the area of behavior. And we used um, our research-based program called Zones of Regulation, which was um, developed by an occupational therapist who specializes in executive functioning and self-regulation. Uh, she then sold her program for lots of money to a program called Social Thinking, and they now run trainings and develop materials that apply to this program. But the focus is really quite simple in that all of us in this room, all students have but emotions and feelings, and that's okay. But ideally, we want to stay in the blue zone most of the time, okay? So as human beings, we know that we have to have social norms, and this program really focuses on the social norms that fall in the green zone. Um, the yellow zone is known as our caution zone, where it's like okay to have a little bit of those emotions, but too much is going to push you over into that over something over hyper. Um, so, and then the blue zone is we have kids who are struggling with anxiety and sadness. Um, and our red zone is our angry kids. And the whole program focuses on it's okay to have emotions in every zone so long as you have coping strategies to get you back to your baseline. Um, and that's one thing that I really like about it is that we're teaching kids that it's okay to feel that way and don't know how they feel, but then focus on getting yourself back to that area independently. And they have power over their own behavior. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been piloting these zones the regula regulation lessons in the ICT setting in fifth grade at Bernie. Um, Kathy really is wonderful and welcomes us in to be her. So I've been going over there and teaching weekly lessons with them. Um, from there, I've offered asynchronous professional development on zones of regulation that will again be available over the summer and hopefully to more of our people who are interested in branching out to it. And then we've also ordered zones of regulation material for every grade level at all four of our elementary schools, in addition to all of our self contained classes. So um, in addition to that, we built a library of picture books similar to what we did with our mentor text and our CRA text. Where people are going to be able to pull from those resources to start teaching their own zone lessons in their classroom. So my real goal is to develop a schoology course where everybody can go and pull from a base of lessons. And if their class is struggling with this on a given week, they can then come and find the resources and tailor it to what their class is dealing with on any given time. So as you 
can tell by our late evening enthusiasm. We're doing really wonderful things. We are going to continue to focus on doing these wonderful things as uh, we move into next year. Um, so, you know, as the bullet points say, we're going to continue to transition um, our classrooms up and look at more integrated co teaching opportunities for our students. We're going to continue to work with Alan on um, providing staff development for the integrated co teaching model as well as special instruction. Um, working with Miller High School on targeted interventions just for our students with disabilities, along with any struggling students. We have lots of struggling students right now. We're going to consider the expansion of our choice of support to the commencement level. We're going to continue to work on some targeted um, support for our consistent class or referrals to special education and really that pre referral intervention process. Because students have a right to interventions in general education. You know, I, I'm always talking about what their rights are once they get to us, but they really have lots of rights prior to them getting to us. And um, really, uh, the other pieces. Uh, Maria working with the related service providers on level recommendations from students who receive related services. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to us and for having us here tonight. We really appreciate your time and your Any questions? Yeah, I'm kind of usually here at some point in time. The things, how many students are we talking about right now that are considered uh, under the special? Right now, are you seeing within the CPSC community? Are you seeing uh, an expansion of those numbers? Yes. <laughs> so, I guess my question is with that continued expansion of stuff, I know it's I'm guessing very, very helpful having toast in, in the program. Is that something that needs to be more permanent? It's, 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 notice you're saying it's toast is supportive of commencement level. Is that secondary 912? 912. So those things to support not only the CPSE side of it, but the growth of the program as it starts to hold through the grades and stuff. Where, where do you see this happening? I just, I can't, I don't. See, where there's sure. four of you dealing with over 500 students plus the growth in the CPSC population. So it just seems like an awful lot to do. It's a lot. Um, I, you know, right now, I think that a part of that a lot has to do with the consequence of COVID. So I think it's a more honest answer to come and say that up and down. And the ICT is going into the high school next April. Okay. How quickly do you see that transitioning into the rest of the grade levels? So, one of the promises that we made to just ourselves when we made this decision was that we would do it slowly, methodically. Um, so, we're not making any preemptive jumps, and we're taking that fifth grade class slowly up. And at the elementary level, we are looking at specific cultural groups to make that specific decision. And if the students who want an ICT level, whether it's cultural or that, it's better to go to the school. Then we would work with that and then we would sit down with that. Part of the professional development. Has been around helping teachers understand how to make those decisions around students. So it's not to say that a current 16 to 1 population, eighth grade or not, couldn't be recommended for a less restrictive setting. So, but our current setting is what we think is the biggest goal. Thanks. Any questions? The only comment I have, it's a positive comment, of course, because it's just amazing the work that all of you are doing 
for our students here at Scott Support. And I agree that there are a lot of students that, that are that they're struggling. You know, a lot of students right now are having a lot of, you know, some of them have to do with COVID. But I'm thinking back to your presentation last year, and I remember you having a slide up there that said uh, next steps for your department. I remember those things that were your next steps last year. I was so glad to hear about that this time. So I'm looking at this right now, processing that and I'm looking to hear the progress of what we plan on doing moving forward. And I'm really looking forward to see how well that ICT uh, works for this day and grade level over the next, next year. So thank you for that continuous improvement. Um, as we move forward, and especially like, as we know, everything's constantly changing. And with the zones regulation, I'm in green right now. It actually is that in my building, so I'm very familiar with that. It really does. What we're seeing is students that need co regulation are now starting to sound like they because of that program. You know, we have so many students, especially younger members, I'm sure we're getting that here in Spencer Board as well, that need co regulation. Because of that, because of the same regulation that we need to suffer before. Hopefully, that's what we see here moving forward. So, but thank you. Uh, great information. I really do appreciate it. So excited every time you guys are here to know what, what our, our students are, are getting. Um, Someday I'll learn and understand what everything it is that you do, but, but um, I, I really appreciate the way you do it. Yes, you are doing a great job. You're welcome Everybody. to come to New Teacher Orientation where we go over all the acronyms. Thanks, Thank you so much. So the cost of the Devices, I understood the, the drones a little difficult because we do actually have some on campus, um, which may be a little difficult to add to as an unacceptable piece of technology. Can I just I just want to make sure for our guests at home that you should be on the screen. So the seven and eight thousand series. Now that everybody can see it, um, we do have some drones uh, in a classroom uh, that have been used for some things in, in instructional basis, as well as for uh, fields, doing some, you know, some actual uh, drone-related things. I don't know exactly what else they could do with them. Haven't been used very recently, I understand, uh, but they have been in the past. So, so the background of it what was in, in the student technology section there was um, unacceptable uh, items and, and talk, talk about gaming stations. Uh, and, and one of the things that I, I raised a couple of points is uh, the ability to uh, do remote recording, whether it's a small camera that can be placed somewhere uh, that, that people would know they be recording either video or audio. Um, in the same line, it is drone or remote control devices where 
camera can easily get to some place where you wouldn't know that it's there. Um, so, so I guess it was the word drone kind of generically that um, a, a, a device that can get a recording device somewhere else. Um, so, so I've had um, construction sites where, where drones have popped up where competitors are watching to, to see what's going on. So, mm -hmm. so that's what kind of led me into that statement with the drone. Um, we, we think typically drones outdoors are just going to make you but hey, there could be a drone that at a window watching inside or something. So that's where I was thinking about that. Yes, and, and I think we can look at it as because it, it's if it is really geared with the right wording towards personal student personal devices. Right, yeah. So if a student brings a drone from home that doesn't have approval from the principal or a teacher, I think we can categorize it that way so that it could be incorporated. But there are separate rules for um, the New York State Public High School Athletic Association also issued rules a couple of years ago about equipment drones at sporting events. Um, so we have those rules and a number of years ago we had looked at a policy covering drones, but we had not moved on that policy. Um, so I think incorporating that in the right way. I think, it's a, um, I think that was really the only policy I had uh, a, a comment on. Um, so I'm trying not to use those words, but if there are any other comments, I know. So I, I had one that could be that worse, but that what about instruments and qualified rather than conversations? Yes. Well, when I read it today, I read it as qualified student versus qualified instrument. You said it meant qualified instrument, right? But when I read it, just the drawing, I was like, I read it as the student was being qualified. Right. I think that's why we talked about that policy that talked about it. Yes. There, oh, okay. Yeah. There was, there was another policy that I had found from another country yeah. that we could use to, to better clarify that. It was really related to certain instruments, yeah. not certain students, and what of those large instruments that the district yeah. owns. Yeah, I, I get that part. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was, I, I caught that. Okay, so, so our, our goal is to get through all of these by, by the end of this year, all the policies. Um, and I, I appreciate what you did with, with the, the, the document that has a single. And, and one of the things that I, I've got to be honest, that was so convenient. I read through everything, and, and rather than going back into the notes, I, I think that was really beneficial for people to get extra treated. You know, probably more people read it. Surprising, there's less comments. Um, but our real goal is to get everyone to read and understand all of those. So it's kind of two prongs. So, so not just the work you know, yeah, yeah. Very much straight line. Yeah. Okay, I can and then we'll continue that next time we have. Um, probably special education policies coming up, and then uh, a large group of the seven and eight thousand series that are left. Um, so hopefully, we'll be done by May, and then have everything on the hearing one policies and a draft may go back to the council. Will you be sending us more to review prior to our next meeting? Yes. Okay. Yes. I have to meet with uh, Pescozzi uh, one more time, I think, to just revisit a couple of them. And I'm still finishing up the, of the largest bulk of policies. How do we We have um, next on our agenda the ratification of the successor agreement with the Spencer Court Teacher Association. Um, I know that Jamie had provided you a summary letter, and so um, I open up the floor to any questions or 
uh, any clarification that you might need from Jamie at this time. I'm good. Kevin's just calling. Is there any? I didn't have any questions. No. I, I, I guess I, I would. Um, I, I think I want to ask a little further and, and, and get in. Um, we, we've received some emails uh, about the nurses' side of this contract, so I, I think we, we it, it warrants further discussion. Um, not at this point, and it's not about the ratification, but um, I, I think we do. Uh, it, it, it warrants some additional questions uh, and, and discussion about um, some of the items that were raised uh, about the, the, the nurse's contract, it being tied in with the, the teacher's um, contract. Um, so it's just different items that seem to come up. And, and I just want to bring that up. I don't have any specific statements at this point, but, but I want to let uh, the few people that have reached out to us know that, okay, it's, it's not... Uh, falling in deaf ears. So overall, I am Dave. You have yeah, something? no. So th that being said, I mean, can we address and do something about it another time? Is that you're thinking, or is that a, something I should ask? I don't know, dude. I mean, I know Jamie's is probably wondering what the heck we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, be careful because we're talking negotiation public. So yeah, so yeah. so we're we're, we're not going to. Um, so some of the, the the nurses have have sent um, emails to the board um, with, with questions about it, and at this point, uh, it, they mostly came today. I don't have enough information. So yes, something in the future, if if something needs to be done. Uh, we can still right. um, memorandum of agreement or, or something, right, right, right. should that be necessary. Right, 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 yes. um, but I, I, I guess my point was to acknowledge that there Received are questions out here, here um, about this. Yeah, well said. Um, other than that, um, I, I, I want to share that, that um, I, I'm very pleased that, that um, the we, we have a, uh, a vote for, from the, the uh, bargaining unit that, that they were pleased with the um, outcome of this. And I too am happy, I guess we're, we're done, we're ready to go, we're ready to move forward. Uh, and and um, although the time frame was longer than people may have wished for, um, Negotiations take time, and, and, and we got to, I believe, a good place for um, for for the the teachers and for the district. So, with that, any further comments at this point? I'd like to hear a motion. Motion ratify the successor agreement. Correct. The second. We can take aid. All in favor. Is Leah still online? Oh, is it six zero? Miss Brown. She she raised her. Okay. That would be six zero. Congratulations! I'm excited for everybody. Okay. okay we're moving forward, the um, the next item is the ratification of the successor agreement for SPOMA. Um, again, I know that Jamie had shared a summary letter to the board um, that I'd like to open it up if there's any questions. Conversation. Nope. Questions? No comments. Okay. Motion. Okay. Make a motion to ratify the successor agreement to SCOMA. Second. Second, Mr. Kincaid. All in favor? Ms. Brown? Yep. I'm um, yes. Okay. 6 0. 
Motion passed. Okay. Federal stimulus update. So it goes to the podium. Um, this is an update that uh, we wanted to provide to the board and are mandated to provide to the board in regards to our federal stimulus funding, um, how we're spending the money. As uh, Rick and I have discussed, we thought it would be helpful to uh, give context again to the board, what our original plan was, what some of those revisions have been um, along the way this year, um, and the continued use of the federal stimulus funding. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so again, to Kristen's point, this is one of the assurances that we provided in the application. Uh, so that is a big reason why we're here uh, to meet that obligation. I could probably start off with any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Are you allowed to? I don't have any good jokes either, so sorry. Come on, Rick. You don't have any good accounting jokes? I don't. There we go. I would have. There we go. <clears throat> We got 30 minutes. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. Okay, so just a, a quick refresher. Um, the last time we, we provided an update was back in August of 2021. So in March of 20, uh, we had the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security with the CARES Act. It was broken down into two different grants. One um, is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief for the EAP Fund. The other is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, more commonly referred to as the ESSA. In December of 20, they came out with what, they, what I commonly refer to as the SIRSA Act, or the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplement Appropriations. Again, broken down into two different uh, grants, uh, GEAR and ESSER. And then in March of 21, they had the American Rescue Plan, uh, which again was really more of the uh, ESSER portion, but you'll see that they've allocated that into the 90, what they call the 90% allocation in the state reserve. There's actually four different grant numbers that we have to uh, manage. This slide is sharing with you a big picture of um, when the funding became available. Uh, so for each one, it was March 13th of 2020. Uh, for the CARES Act, you can see that the end date uh, is coming up soon. Uh, the total amount of that grant was 611,000. And again, remember that that was under our general aid, uh, state aid portion. And you can see that we had a, an approval date of um, March 2nd, 2021. The second stimulus package, uh, the SIRSA, uh, again, went back to 20, March 13th. Uh, that ends uh, as far as availability a year after. Uh, the CARES Act, you can see in total, it was 3.3 million, broken down separately into the two different um, sub-brands. The ARP Act uh, goes out a year after that, so in September of 2024. In total, it was 4.9. 4 million of that was related to the 90% allocation, 904 uh, was for the state reserve, and we'll get into a little bit more depth of that uh, in the upcoming slides. I will share the uh, approval date for the 90% uh, uh, was um, relatively recently. Uh, we went back and forth quite a while, uh, but we finally did get it approved, uh, and same with the state reserve. So I just wanted to share a little bit with you. Um, because the uh, CARES Act is, for the most part, done, uh, this is what the initial budget was for. Just like the general fund budget, as things happen throughout this time period, there's things that you may have budgeted for, 
um, that don't occur or vice versa. So what you can see here on, on my right is what had happened. The uh, gear portion was pretty much in line with what we wanted to do. The ESSER portion, uh, you can see that there was a decrease in the professional salaries and an increase in the purchase service. So what the business office did was submit what they call an FS10A, which is an amendment, uh, which eventually got approved by the grants finance office, where we had to allocate money from and take it from the salaries and put that into purchase service. Uh, so you can see that change. Uh, this is preliminary, but um, we're gonna be pretty much right on and use all of that funding. So this will be submitted prior to uh, the due date, which is in October of 22. Any questions as it relates to the CARES Act? Okay, for the SIRSA, again, just as a refresher, this was our initial budget under the year. The types of uh, expenses that we've allocated to that, we've assigned the two um, teachers on special assignment, their related benefits and administrative costs uh, is a direct correlation to the indirect costs. The ESSER portion, again, about 3.1 million. Uh, you can see this is uh, much of what, um, actually I take that back, it's, uh, things that we've done here, we included the four enrichment specialists, um, we added two elementary teachers that was in enrollment driven, and you can see the other areas uh, or types of expenses that were incurred. Any questions on the uh, source side? Hey Rick, so we're in year two of this right now or year, year one? I would probably, you could say either or, Dave, quite honestly, because of the uh, timeline in which it was approved. Okay. It was approved in this year, but because you can go back to the March of 2020, we've incurred some expenses that are already been, have been applied to this. Any other questions on the SIRSA? Okay, so for the RBAC, this is the 90% allocation. This was one federal grant number. You can see it was $4 million. These are the items that um, we provided additional information and uh, that in the, in the past where this includes the four uh, MTSS TOSAs. Uh, you saw Bree tonight as our K-5 special education TOSA. Uh, this is where we're uh, handling the backfill positions for the content focus coaches um, and the majority of other uh, items. I don't know that I need to read through each bullet point. Uh, if you have any questions, as it relates to those items related to the 90% allocation. One thing that you haven't really uh, been provided an update on is the state reserve allocation. So again, it was $904,000. And what they're really uh, asking you to do is identify <laughs> three specific areas that you need to uh, address. One is not less than 5%. Uh, to address the academic impact of lost instructional time. The second is not less than 1% um, for evidence-based summer enrichment programs. And the last is uh, not less than 1% for evidence-based comprehensive after-school programs. So just a little bit about those. For the 5% lost instructional time, uh, you can see that we're including a five-week K-1 summer program commonly referred to as the jump and leap to address the early intervention uh, of literacy and numeracy. Um, we are in the process of creating a four school math workshop uh, for our fourth and fifth grade students at each elementary school. Uh, currently in the process of a 612 summer program and uh, we've identified uh, the potential for staffing to address uh, class size based on enrollment trends. Any questions as it relates to lost instructional time? As it relates to the after school program, again, uh, we've looked at providing academic support in all four core areas in grades six, eight, nine, 12. Uh, again, it's a matter of just identifying uh, Ty, Ty's work uh, with how to, to determine the metrics. 
Any questions on the after school? Similar fashion for the summer learning. Uh, we have a program called the uh, Summer Academy uh, to provide targeted intervention. Uh, again, five week program. We've run this in the past. We're using uh, stimulus funds to help fund that program. Any questions on summer learning? Okay, amendments and next steps. As I mentioned, there's a fluidity to uh, these grants. So as things come up, as Ty, uh, as he works with the building principals and instructional team to identify different metrics, um, we can make changes. But you can already, you already know that we've made some changes to what was originally budgeted for as it relates to being able to retain and attract staff. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of the COVID response team, but one of the takeaways I uh, interpreted was that the concern for social emotional um, as they move forward. So again, we have an opportunity to look at these metrics, analyze things that are happening in the buildings um, and make changes to those grants to address that, these particular needs. Again, uh, as we look at the different metrics for uh, academics, they can make changes for lost instructional time. Professional development is an area, again, that uh, we may need to look into. Contractual services, as an example, um, we actually uh, are having a difficult time hiring a psychologist, so we've had to contract that out. That's an example that was an unbudgeted expense that we are now shifting from one area to another to address that particular need. And I listed just some additional materials and supplies, again, that we've already run into. Uh, laptops, additional laptops, if we had to make that switch in the event that um, you know, we went full remote. Uh, screens at Burnaby uh, so that we can work on the air filtration. Uh, even paper. Uh, with the supply and demand, uh, we get our paper through uh, the co BOCES co-op bid. Uh, that vendor um, had to withdraw from that. So we were actually in a paper shortage, quite honestly. So we diverted that. To me, that's a direct uh, COVID uh, expense, rather. Uh, and you can see some of the other items there. So really, um, that's a very quick rundown of where we stand in our federal stimulus funding. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, Rick, can you address kind of um, you know, what you're thinking is, and I know it's not you know, all put in stone yet, but where, where are we going you know, with these great programs that are being put in place, the summer learning, the, you know, the math tutoring, how does that get sustained um, when this stuff runs out? Well, I mean, that's the big, that's the big question, right, Gary? It, it's, it's the fiscal cliff that the federal government, the state government, local government have, have um, identified as districts need to be careful because when this money runs out, what are we going to do? So I think in previous presentations, we talked about the CSS, the content focus coaches. Um, that's supposed to build capacity. Okay. And, you know, for those backfill positions, as the years progress throughout this period of time, we're going to have um, you know, retirements that we can hopefully fill those so that we're not adding additional staff. We've really looked at trying to identify one time expenses. The initial budgets that uh, I shared with you, that's it was really the focus, but obviously, you know, we've had to turn on dime a little bit to address quite a few different areas to retain and attract staff. That's going to be a, a legacy cost uh, that we're going to have to manage. Um, some of the other programs, uh, again, we are, you know, much of those, the summer programs are in our general fund budget. So we've diverted some money as a temporary relief to address some of those other items that have come up. So this is really, it's, as I mentioned before, it's a fluid process. Yeah. And the fortunate thing is we have until September of 23, September of 24, uh, really to address these as we go through our budget development process. Okay, thanks, Rick. It's, it's definitely in the forefront of our mind yeah. okay. because we know at some point this, <clears throat> this money runs out and we have to maintain the progress that um, we're accustomed to. Yeah. Okay. 
And Gary, if I could just add, we're also looking closely at our data to really understand the, what the learning loss is. So for example, at the elementary level, Ty and I were having conversations that um, the students might be recovering well academically, but what we're finding is their readiness to learn, their social emotional needs. Um, and so then, you know, when Rick talks about the fluidity, we start thinking differently about our summer program. Is there something that we could do um, that helps those very young late learners who are doing okay academically, but it's just their social emotional readiness? And, and do we target that? And, and, and might that just be a short term need that we have as students come back into our system in a more typical way? And lastly, I just want to share again as part of um, this assurance. Please note that the completed application, the budget narratives that explain the detail behind the budget numbers, um, work with Lynette, that is all posted on our website. There is an email there for uh, if the community members or staff, anyone has questions um, or suggestions, they should email uh, us and, and we can address those. Rick, you know, you, when Gary asked that question, you responded with that fiscal clip. And what I think about is all the work that we continue to do to think about long-term financial planning. And we're going to continue to need to get these updates and really closely monitor what are our priorities in, in regards to, you know, the academic growth, the social emotional growth. And we're going to have to continue to monitor how students are doing and, and what we need to provide for them. Um, because we're going to, with not knowing where we're going to be in a couple of years with this money, we're going to have to really prioritize and make some big decisions. So I think we have to continue to closely monitor needs of students and what we need to provide them and really take a look at what our priorities are going to be based on that. And we need to continue to have updates like this um, so that when we do make decisions that are going to impact our future, we're making decisions that are going to keep us in a real sound fiscal health. I'm just said it better. Yeah, I continue to think about you know all this money that we've received, um, using it, and we're using it in great ways, and we're seeing results. But at the same time, not forget about that long-term financial plan. Where are our priorities, and make sure we stay financially healthy as we move forward. 100% agree. Thanks, Rick. Reading evaluation. It's a good one. Got to see lots of kids. Got to see lots of kids. And, and I, I, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, a lot of um, great reports tonight. It was good to get caught up on some of the work that's been done um this year and getting those reports from various groups and having the students here that bright spot was awesome thank you rick for not taking the the, the 30 minutes that was, was allotted for that conversation mm -hmm. but very important to have all that information come out so with and that it's time i'd like to make a motion for the board to move into executive session for the purpose of discussing the employment employment history of particular persons. Okay, with that, second. Second. Gerardo, uh, all in favor? Ms. Brown? Yeah, I'm a yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. We'll call you.